are all here and thanks everyone for participation and uh, thanks Claudia and and uh, our, our great speakers from University of Virginia. And you may or may not notice, but I'm sporting my colors here as uh, Professor Elliot Weiss would be proud to see a Darden sweatshirt. So um, I first ran into University of Virginia when, when I was there um, uh, getting my MBA. Um, but that's not the purpose of today's call. Uh, our work group has been focusing now for a few years on getting nation's most innovative and best uses of data, technology, and analytics to accomplish different clinical and business objectives, the, uh, the, really the, the thing that EHI does so well. And so uh, um, we have been spending time on the traditional sources and uses of data, and there's a lot of information available for those that are still struggling with some of those uh, initiatives. And we focused on transitions of care and analytics and the merging of clinical and claims data to be able to have the insight to, to improve population health. Last year, we did, we were asked to do the non-traditional sources of data. And so we spent a lot of time on many different areas. Each one was interesting and had Mayo Clinic and all kinds of great speakers and had a session on social determinants of health. So that has obviously become an area of interest that's been greater, uh, you know, demand has, is, is popping up everywhere. So we double clicked on that this year and you can go to the next slide, Claudia. And uh, this year we decided to have different topics about social determinants of health, ones ranging from the role of public health information exchanges in enabling SDOA exchange, the categories of data and how to codify that information so it can be used, the role of telehealth, remote monitoring, and patient reported data to enable social determinants, and we'll touch on that today, how can collaboratives align for stakeholders to capture and utilize SDOH? And we had a good presentation, our last one on that. And then today is really converging technologies, how many of these different things, how they will impact and utilize uh, SDOH. Uh, if we have time in the rest of the year, and I think we will since people aren't traveling, we'll get into policy and operational issues surrounding surveillance and behavior. Um, any other topics that this work group is only as good as the contributions of people that participate. So uh, if you have other topics you'd like us to address, feel free to let us know. Uh, and if you have other presenters on some of these topics to share best practices, also please let us know. Okay, next slide. So one thing that sort of makes this a, a very interesting uh, uh, area is, hang on, Claudia, if that's okay, we'll be real brief. When I first met Dr. Karen Ruban, Karen, I think it's gotta be 15 years ago, maybe something like that. Uh, you had an amazing telehealth set of capabilities and there was a world that focused on bringing the power of telehealth to, to medicine. And it was powerful and ahead of its time. At the same time, there was an emerging health information exchange world, which was the beginning of EHI and, and where it came. And those two worlds didn't really even combine that much, but UVA was one of the places that sought ways to sort of link them together because they're not separate tools and initiatives, but rather capabilities that when combined can be very powerful. Now you can click one and you keep going and then there were powerful things like image exchange and being able to share diagnostic images. And it in and of itself had its own world, but it combined with HIE was powerful. Combining telehealth HIE and image exchange brings different use cases to light. Now comes the really powerful analytics and AI, which has really been emerging in a lot of ways. And one more click. And there are people focused on that and then there are people focused on social determinants of health the impact on social determinants by bringing technology and how to utilize information about social determinants to make a difference but you see all the different vectors and combinations it really is 
the ability to use all of these different pieces to make a difference in people's lives that we're going to hear uh, Amy and, and Dr. Karen Ruban uh, do. And we're going to be striving to figure out how these vectors coalesce for the next uh, years. Um, so people that are finding good uh, examples of that, please bring them to light and we'd like to, to share them. So clicking one more. Um, and, you know, it's combining these with all the different capabilities that are out there in digital health and communications, et cetera. So that's just setting up what we're going to talk about today. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Amy Salerno, who is involved in a lot of different things. Um, and to have her tell the story of how she's not only accomplishing a great deal, but using a, a very innovative technology uh, out of Texas called Pieces Technology. So take it away, doctors. <clears throat> Thanks, guys, so much. Um, really appreciate the, the time and all of the work that you all are doing. I actually think there's a huge and massive great deal of overlap between um, HIE and social determinants of health and a lot of learnings um, that we need to apply as I, I think we'll talk a little bit about in this and um, I really think our partner in pieces technology is really leading the way in in thinking through that with us so uh, Ruben on the line with me as well and I think we'll we'll go through and talk through some of this so go to the next slide um, so I just, I know our focus is really on data, but I just like to kind of say why. Um, I, I'm a general internist and have a core mission of improving health equity through systems change and data and technology can really help and enable that, but, but they're, they help and enable um, and we, and our kind of vision. And so really thinking about, um, health equity as, as the framework for all of the work that um, I'm leading here at UVA um, really boils down to life expectancy difference. And so even in our small college town of Charlottesville, Virginia, which I know has been in national news around um, race tensions with our white supremacist rallies that were here a few years ago, um, but here in our local town, life expectancy difference, like so many other cities, <laughs> is greater than 10 years in just less than two miles. Um, and they're predominantly along racial lines, so the neighborhood with the lowest life expectancy is predominantly black, and the neighborhood with the highest life expectancy is predominantly white. Um, and we know you all have been talking about social determinants for a long time, so you know that the context um, of these, this disparity and inequity in life expectancy is largely related to systemic um, structural issues and social determinants of health and the environments around where people live. So access to food, access to safe and appropriate housing, um, education, employment, income, all of these sorts of um, factors relate to it. And I think a lot of it is structural, structurally built in the neighborhood. And so thinking about what, next slide, what can um, UVA uh, do? And I just <coughs> highlight um, COVID-19 coronavirus is just worsening all of the existing disparities, both kind of in the specific neighborhoods along racial inequities, and then our most vulnerable populations that already had worse health outcomes. I saw that you all are focusing some in EHI on Indian Health Service. I worked in the Indian Health Service for a couple years. They've had really uh, devastating effects from the coronavirus, jails, prisons, homeless, populations um, and then again of course the racial inequities and so these social determinants of health um, are the underlying reason why these disparities are worsening um, in the context of COVID and so all of the work that we've done is really pertinent to the current situation. Um, next slide. So thinking about what does this have to do with UVA if I'm talking about our whole community and we know that our own patients have some have many of these social needs um, 
And so within our inpatient units, about almost half of our patients have identified a social need and some study that one of my colleagues, Dr. Michael Williams, has done here at UVA. Um, and in our outpatient settings in our clinics, we embedded this into our Prescani score looking for social needs in our outpatient patients. And um, about a third of our patients identified having a social need. These social needs are significantly associated with poorer health outcomes and utilization, for example, a greater than um, two relative risk of non-emergent ED visits um, for food insecurity, for health instability, and even worse with utility insecurity. Um, so this is significantly impacting not only our whole community and wanting to improve health equity, but also the patients that walk through our hospital doors and relates directly to worse health outcomes. Um, so the next slide, um, really, this is kind of like, well, what, what can UVA Health do as a healthcare system? And so as we went down this path thinking about how do we want to how do we want to play, how do we want to participate and partner in our community to help our community um, improve health equity and improve the, the lives of our overall community? We considered these key principles. One is that we need to think about how we address social needs when and where they arise which is frequently not in the hospital and in the clinic, but actually in the community. And so if you can get upstream and make sure that the programs and investments that you're doing are able to be enacted, not just in the four walls of your hospital or clinic, um, but also in the community, I think that was really important for us. Um, we want to make sure that the investments we're making were also able to connect people when they come in and say that they have a need but we don't want them to have to wait until they get to us. And the second was that our community-based organizations, our housing, um, our homelessness coalition, our food banks, um, all of the organizations that are working in these areas um, diligently for like decades are the experts and solutions should empower and enable to do their work better and more efficiently and more. It's not like there aren't existing systems out there, the solutions, it's new for healthcare providers to be in this space. Um, so our solution should raise up the existing infrastructure um, rather than, than suppress it um, or overwhelm it. Um, and then la uh, third is that we need to find solutions that meet us where we are. Um, and that relates to both UVA Health, and I'll go into greater detail about this because I think this was really key for us um, picking uh, pieces technology to help us in this, in this uh, journey that we are on um, because it's really important for um, our programs and our, and our technologies to start where we are on that journey of addressing social determinants of health, which might be that we're doing nothing and if we're doing nothing currently, what's the next baby step? And can the technology take us through all of the steps that we need to do um, to get towards a systemic and systematic way of addressing social needs for our patients and then for the larger community? And it also means meeting the community-based organizations where they currently are and helping them along that connectivity journey as well. Um, and finally, uh, and most uh, important in order to have a continued and sustained um, investment and in funding in this work is that it must align with our, our overall strategy and has to relate to key health system metrics. And so I'll talk a little bit about each one of those, but that's really kind of our framework for how we thought through what we were going to address. Next slide. So to start with, um, because community was at the center of it and we really wanted to elevate community, we partnered with community-based organizations across education, um, food, mental health, free clinics, housing, um, and transportation uh, to, to help us think through how we collectively as a community wanted to address this. And we asked them to help vet 
our technology company with us so that whatever we were investing in was going to help our community partners and that they were excited and ready to help address these needs for our patients. Um, and so the next slide uh, is where led uh, is what led us to pieces technology. So we we looked at several different um, vendors and not one particular vendor is necessarily right for anyone, but pieces technology came along as not just a vendor, but a true partner. Um, and I will let Ruben, uh, if you want to kind of take a stab at explaining um, well, yeah. that, but if you want to go ahead and uh, yeah. talk about pieces. That's great. Well, thank you all. Thanks for inviting us to, to, to join you, Amy. Um, Pieces Technologies, as, as was mentioned, was based out of Dallas. Um, we're a very clinically oriented organization, uh, but we have two components to our work. The first on the left-hand side is Pieces Predict, um, and it's, a, uh, it's an AI machine learning platform that takes data out of various host systems, um, EMRs, data warehouses, um, other transactional systems, and really tries to predict what may happen to an individual clinically, as well as from a social factor standpoint. And the idea would be that if you can raise the social determinant issues in the clinical setting in the, in the course of the workflow, uh, then you could, you could really impact them and make sure that the, the individuals can get to the right resources. Um, and then on the right-hand side is Pieces Connect, um, which is a really kind of meant to be a lightweight a uh, fully linked case management platform that is really designed for community organizations, for housing organizations, for fire departments, for uh, food banks, uh, family and social support, uh, employment income. And the idea is that uh, this needs to be a platform that, th that these organizations can use for their own needs, wherever they are, free in, in, in some cases if needed, you know, um, and um, really uh, allowing even you know elderly volunteers that are working at a, at a at a church food bank or food pantry to be able to use the platform uh, relatively easily all the way to more sophisticated organizations that need to do complicated reporting and so the idea there is to continue to build the musculature of a of a community um, and to help them um, achieve their missions and their needs and then also then working with health systems. And so that, that is the idea with the two platforms. Thanks, Ruben. So you can see from, from the connection of these two pieces why this was such a really amazing um, platform for both the health system to invest in and it really aligned with our, really our first two um, priority issues around centering around the community and making sure um, the community was served by the platform and that's why our community partners helped us to pick this platform. So we go to the next slide. Um, so really the pieces community connect uh, for us really serves a need because it allows individuals in the community who may have never even entered the healthcare system yet who have a social need, if they enter into any community-based resource in our region, for them to be able to refer to other resources in our community. So if they enter into um, the community college and the community college identifies that they have housing insecurity and food insecurity, the community college can refer directly to the housing provider and the food provider um, so it's really a true network and make sure that we're, we're going upstream and not waiting for people to hit our healthcare system with dire needs um, before, before we're connecting them to resources. Um, and then as Ruben was talking about, it really elevates the community-based organization by acting as a full case management platform as well for them and it helps them track their own data so they're more able to apply for grants, get additional funding, and, and be able to prove their value. Um, and it really kind of elevates all of the resources in our community. And so it was a really uh, easy answer for um, our community partners and for us to choose this. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. So 
Um, I think this is really the really big key for us, um, which is meet us where we are. Um, and so Ruben, uh, I'll, I'll just talk about where we were um, uh, three years ago when, when I came to UVA and started is that we, we have many, um, many individuals across the health system who feel really passionately about this and have um, done individual quality improvement projects or research projects or student-led projects around social determinants of health screening or referrals. Um, and clearly we have some social workers that work, but um, we did not have any sort of system-wide uh, way that we were moving forward. And whenever we talk about implementing social determinants of health screening, people get really anxious and nervous if you're going to ask people in the clinic or in the hospital to do screening when you don't have anything to do with the answers to that screening. And so, um, so we had a lot of pushback from implementing a screening tool right to begin with. And people also said, well, people already may tell us, but we don't have any place to record things consistently. And so uh, pieces kind of had a, an answer for us here. And Ruben, I don't know if you want to talk about the predict tool. Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the things we found, and, and it's certainly been the case with UVA as well, is that um, that physicians and care coordinators and others spend a lot of time, um, you know, indirectly documenting information that is relevant to social determinants just in their normal care course of work. So one of our philosophies is, can we extract that using natural language processing? What you're seeing here uh, is just a, is just a visual of how pieces in the background reviewing doctor's notes, case management notes, social worker notes, and, and identifying and finding um, the social determinants that's been identified. Um, if you go to the next screen, I think it uh, will kind of show an example uh, from, from a clinical note where, uh, where pieces was reviewing the note and it was identifying areas uh, that may be potential discharge barriers or things that needed to be done uh, for the patient to kind of move forward. And yeah, on one side, identifying clinical issues like this is doctors writing planning for antibiotic therapy, pending infectious disease recommendations. So the infectious disease service needs to come and see the patient prior to discharge all the way to, um, you know, that this individual doesn't have family support. And every health system um, is, is documenting this information in different ways. So one of the, one of the capabilities of technology, not just pieces, but, but any kind of modern technology is that um, we have the capabilities of natural language processing and other things to to reduce the workload, to reduce the data entry, um, and really capture from what is already being narratively documented by by our providers. Um, and so PISA specifically will be looking for um, all the categories of social determinants in various levels of detail and then surfing, surfacing those so they can be, you know, so that an individual can be further assessed uh, whether or not they need to be sent to the right resource in the community. Um, there's a lot of ways that it could be done. So that's how uh, pieces predict, one of the things that pieces predict does. Thanks, next slide. Um, so just as an example, um, this is at UVA with pieces predict running on our electronic health record system just this, just this year. Um, showing um, kind of all of the different social vulnerabilities that it was able to pull out um, of, uh, of charts of, of our inpatient um, encounters. And so out of all of the inpatient encounters, you can see there were many different issues where we were already documenting, even despite um, the fact that we don't have a standardized screening tool. Um, of issues around social vulnerabilities. And so by doing this, we can flag these and then refer all of these patients where this is documented to social work proactively earlier in their um, hospital course. Using the pieces connect can refer them to the correct community-based organization um, that can help address their need um, and we are still in the process of implementing this, and so is our community partners. And so they'll they will then receive the referral in pieces connect to be able to close the loop with us. This is a yet to happen, but is the the 
plan and has the capability, pieces has the capability for then the community-based organization to send us back information that yes, the patient got there and their needs were met or no, the patient didn't come, they were a no-show or whatever reason there was. Um, so next slide. Um, and the other key, and then I think we're, we're short on time, I wanna make sure Karen has a chance to talk. So this is the part where I feel like it's really critical um, and works specifically with the HIE um, topic and the, the kind of importance of interoperability. So a lot of our community-based organizations already have existing data infrastructure. Um, and some referral platforms or help or homelessness um, information management system, HIMS. Um, and so it's really critical that whatever tools, the health systems are newly investing in the social space also work and are interoperable with the existing platforms in the community to get the best and most robust um, use out of it. And PIECES has been a really great partner in thinking through this with us. Um, and Ruben, I don't know if you wanna talk about the, this and the national context and the work that you all are doing nationally around this. Yeah, no, thank you, Amy. I, I mean, obviously, to to folks in the 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 on the call that are involved with HIE interoperability, obviously, is something that um, people have been working on for a long time, and we think the social determinant space obviously is no different. So um, we've been trying to, you know, take a lesson from um, the 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 great work that's been occurring with HIEs for the last you know several decades. Um, and, and trying to think through um, in, in a variety of different forums, uh, what are the ways that the communication around social determinants information can be standardized, um, in a, a, you know, not only in the kind of nomenclature and description, and, and we're seeing a lot of efforts, obviously, with Z codes, um, and as well as like the, the, the categorization of this information, but also to start working with um, with uh, kind of non-healthcare platforms to uh, uh, get information from. So Network to Work is an example of, of the UVA um, um, platform and organization that's working on uh, job support. Uh, but there, I think we're finding in kind of every community across the United States, there's, there's a, a lot of different platforms um, in education, in social services, in housing, um, the, the list goes on and on. And ultimately, you know, it, the idea of creating a village of bringing all these different groups together beyond just the healthcare systems is a, is a gigantic task, it, it, but very important if you can do it with the right privacy consent, um, standardization issues. Uh, we know that that's what's needed for addressing these non-clinical determinants that can have such a profound impact. So I think the interoperability with platforms that are not typically health platforms is gonna be a really important um, set of work and activity over the next decade, I think. Next slide. Um, so I'll just mention briefly, again, I think aligning to the health system strategy was really key and critical. And so for us, um, where we do not have a lot of value-based payment um, contracts, aligning with uh, length of stay was really critical. And you can see uh, the increased number of social needs um, leads to increased length of stay and percent of excess length of stay. So it's not uh, based, adjusted for DRG. So it's not just, um, related to the severity of illness. And this is information that PIECES was able to create for us, um, a report that we that we get from them. Um, next slide. Um, the, those sorts of reports and the way that we track patients across the care journey um, is really kind of the, the key um, to us as a healthcare system in thinking around how we can address social determinants of health and how it ties to the health system strategy. Um, I just, just in, Ruben, I would want, if you have a quick comment on this, I don't, I wanna make sure we have time for Karen. Yeah, I, I, 
Yeah, no, I, I, nothing more to add except that, that this is just sort of the the closed loop approach that we take in it. PC comes in the health system, out of the health system, and the data from both, both the health system as well as the community can really contribute to a better understanding of uh, what's occurring and building new evidence-based pathways um, that I think, you know, has to be generated, you know, with new observational data over the next, over the next several years. Um, so uh, this is this is kind of one way of, of thinking and looking about looking at getting that end to end longitudinal data for understanding what works best. Great, thanks. Next slide. So, um, so we talked a little bit about coronavirus like worsening all of these disparities, and so we really kind of at the time of this uh, pandemic felt like we needed to leverage our existing infrastructure to address these vulnerable populations. So thinking about a new and acute social needs and how can we leverage this? And so we really use Pieces Connect um, to do that. Uh, one, through a community call line where our medical students are answering um, calls from individuals who otherwise do not have access to primary care. Um, and they can connect people to social services as well as um, directly to a primary care provider. Um, and then we've used pieces, natural language processing, artificial intelligence to help us evaluate for disparities in access to testing for COVID. So looking at disparities based on social needs that have been identified or race or ethnicity. Um, and what is our, what is the availability of testing for those populations? Um, and then uh, also we've we've partnered a lot. Um, I, I've, I, Dr. Rubin uh, is one of my uh, favorite people and a mentor for me at UVA Health, and has just been such an incredible supportive person throughout all of this. Um, and have really gotten to work a lot with Dr. Rubin since. Um, since coronavirus, and so we've been really able to leverage a lot of the work that she's led in telehealth and has already, had already been integrated into the prisons, but we've now integrated into jails and to homeless shelters um, in partnership with Dr. Rubin for, for doing telehealth for these vulnerable populations. Um, and so it's been a really beautiful thing to get to see how telehealth can try to reach out um, to break down some of these equity barriers. The next slide. Um, however, I will say that outside of those institutions, um, knowing that staying home and being able to isolate is a really critical um, piece of staying safe during coronavirus, and, and that's part of the reason why the inequities in coronavirus have existed is people can't work, work from home a lot of times in these vulnerable communities. Um, but in addition to that, access to broadband internet, access to smartphones, access to my chart and telehealth um, is really inequitable. And so access to telehealth has actually become a really critical social determinant of health in the time of COVID. Um, and with that, I will transition over to Karen. Thank you, Amy. So I just want to say it's bi-directional and I am energized by wonderful colleagues such as you and our team. So thank you. Uh, so it's a pleasure to um, join this conversation today. I'm going to speak a little more broadly about our telehealth program, how we have uh, changed uh, in, in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so next slide, please. Probably most of you are very much aware of uh, the role of telehealth uh, and as an academic medical center, we have aligned our telehealth program with uh, all of our academic missions. So patient care and patient outreach, research and education facilitated by communications technologies. And the bulk of our activities surround live interactive synchronous telemedicine encounters, some asynchronous store and forward services, remote patient monitoring, clinical video conferencing for collaborative patient management, such as tumor boards or Project ECHO in terms of case presentations, uh, and even CATH conference, cardiac CATH conference with referring providers. And we also have an e-consult program, which is basically a structured curbside consult uh, within the context of the electronic medical record. And of course, as this group knows for sure, telehealth is not a specialty in and of itself, it's simply a tool. Uh, and at UVA, we uh, manage that centrally and deploy broadly across the enterprise. 
Next, please. Next slide. Thank you. We know the benefits accrue to patients, to health professionals, to hospital systems, and to communities uh, by improving access to specialty care, reduce unnecessary travel, meet consumer demand, facilitate improved outcomes, expand the reach of our providers, increase workforce expertise and capacity, facilitate better continuity of care. For hospitals, it grows strategic partnerships, improve transfer coordination, and fills gaps in specialty coverage. And for our communities, if we can improve care delivered in the community setting uh, improves the health of our populations. We support our healthcare facilities and mitigate workforce shortages. Next, please. So there are many models of telehealth. Uh, they may include health systems such as our own as an academic medical center with a classical hub and spoke model. Also, then he extended to the home pre-coronavirus. Everybody extended to the home post-coronavirus. Uh-oh, can we go back? No, nope, wrong way. Forward. One more. Good. Uh, and you also know, sorry, go back one. <laughs> back one, please. Yeah. So the Veterans Health Administration has long engaged in telehealth, and that has been all the more so post coronavirus. There's telemedicine services companies, retail clinics, pharmacy clinics, workplace clinics, school based clinics, aging in place models, and of course, direct to consumer. And the light at the end of the tunnel for me originally was. Um, uh, our private pay parity reimbursement legislation that went into law, signed into law in 2010 for telemedicine. But in fact, it was the oncoming freight train of consumer demand for access to healthcare services virtually. Next, please. So uh, pre-COVID-19, for our clinical mission, we supported about 20,000 patient encounters in the Commonwealth of Virginia annually. Our clinicians from more than 60 different subspecialties participated, every, cl every clinical service line. We are integrated with teleradiology and we document within EPIC. So in our acute stroke program, and there's a picture at the top of Dr. Andy Sutherland, one of our vascular neurologists who um, manages our, some of much of our telestroke tele program with his partners. Um, and for every telestroke encounter, we have access to the radiographic images uh, and everything is documented within EPIC REMR. Uh, we've supported uh, more than 4,500 e-consults, uh, remote patient monitoring at home. Uh, regardless of the payment mechanisms, we were doing it because it was the right thing to do and that was in partnership with a local startup called Locus Health. We serve more than 11,000 patients, primarily initially triggered by a hospital discharge, but there are also certain chronic conditions by which, for which we've deployed remote monitoring. We do asynchronous telemedicine screening for diabetic retinopathy. Diabetes is the number one cause of blindness in working adults. And uh, we know that many patients do not have access to ophthalmologists for the screenings. And so we've established a program where in community settings, usually federally qualified health centers and some practices, we can get non-midriatic images of the retina of a diabetic patient. You know, I previously served as chair of the Virginia Board of Medical Assistance Services, Medicaid, where we had one third of our patients were the medically complex patients who consumed two thirds of financial resources and those included the age of the blind and the disabled. And two thirds of our patients are um, you know, pregnant women, pediatric patients and our Medicaid expansion population and they consume considerably less resources. So if we can prevent illness by screening, of course, it's a no brainer. And we've also integrated some new AI enabled technologies for diagnosis of um, diabetic retinopathy. Prior to COVID-19, uh, we tracked our, one of the metrics we tracked were miles of driving avoided. And uh, again, prior to COVID-19, that was 21 million miles of travel in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And lastly, we have a special pathogen uh, and emergency preparedness telemedicine program, which was launched during the Ebola outbreak. Or in our MICU special pathogens unit, we utilize telemedicine technologies to reduce provider exposure and to conserve PPE. And that has, of course, expanded massively, scaled massively post COVID-19. Next, please. So we have an educational mission, whether it's undergraduate medical education, graduate medical education, continuing medical education, nurse training, uh, nurse practitioner training. Uh, we have international education and patient education. Next, please. And research is also part of our mission as an academic institution. I don't have to spend a lot of time, but we do have a number of grants. And we are the uh, Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center funded by HRSA serving eight states in the District of Columbia. Next, please. We use, uh, up until COVID-19 only, exclusively HIPAA compliant, interoperable FDA approved technologies. Um, 
and that can include uh, support telemedicines at the desktop, telemedicine at fixed video endpoints, tablets, mobile carts. We utilize the Tido Care device for remote examination, and we have deployed telemedicine from EMS vehicles as well. Next, please. Um, metrics are an important part of our program, uh, and I don't want to spend a huge amount of time, it's a chunky slide, but to say that we do track performance metrics, clinical outcomes metrics, and patient satisfaction. And one of the things that I particularly love about our acute stroke telemedicine program is that treatment rates with TPA parallel that if you came de novo to our emergency room. And I'm talking about treatment rates for patients in very rural communities treated at critical access hospitals and locations where previously access to stroke neurology services was not, was not available. We track uh, reductions in preterm deliveries, hospital days, um, abnormalities in diabetic retinopathy, telepsychiatry, decrease in missed appointments, um, diabetes prevention and treatment, uh, and performance metrics. How quickly can we connect? How quickly can we get the radiographic images imported to us? And again, uh, patient satisfaction. Next, please. So in 2019, we underwent a strategic planning process and our goals at the end of that, we came out saying we wanna use more telemedicine to improve patient access to care improve UVA and referring provider engagement, a number of different mechanisms, expand chronic disease management through remote monitoring tools, and improve transfer management and care coordination. All of these came out of our strategic planning process and we had a, a significant number of leadership changes. So not everything was implemented uh, at the end of 2019. Our new EVP for Health Sciences arrived in uh, February of 2020. Next, please but so did COVID-19. And I laugh about this. I shamelessly stole this from the uh, Twitter account of the Cybersecurity Hub. Actually, I asked for their permission, but haven't heard from them. Who led the digital transformation of your company? Was it the CEO? Was it the CTO? No, it was COVID-19. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah, so COVID-19 really helped us to advance pandemic-related solutions above and beyond our telemedicine strategic plan across inpatient, outpatient, and post-acute settings. So to improve access, patient triage, and better manage patient care, reduce um, patient and provider exposure and conserve PPE, backfill the huge numbers of primary care and specialty care visits that were um, canceled because early in the COVID-19 pandemic, we accelerated the opening of our new bed tower and then deployed the ISACOM's uh, virtual PPE technologies in every isolation room, more than 100 rooms across our health system, and expanded training internally and externally. Next, please. So we established COVID-19 clinics for screening and testing, expanded remote patient monitoring for quarantine patients and for those with chronic illness. And thanks to Amy's work, uh, including at a hotel where we're monitoring homeless COVID-19 patients uh, with our remote monitoring solutions. We developed workflows to enable the transition of in-clinic visits to virtual visits, including graduate medical education workflows as well. I mentioned the ISACOM Special Pathogen Program. We rapidly scaled telemedicine to congregate care settings such as long-term care, and also, as Amy mentioned, in our homeless clinic. Um, we developed a direct-to-consumer portal to enable urgent care services that went live in early June, connects to our emergency department, expanded training, and the streamlined telemedicine contracting because there, there are federal requirements in terms of uh, Medicare conditions of participation standards. Next, please. We were grateful, I don't have to repeat all of this, to say that the public health emergency enabled many uh, um, uh, reductions of the restrictions that we faced prior to COVID-19. Uh, this happened for Medicare, for Medicaid, uh, the relaxation of the Office of Civil Rights Enforcement of HIPAA, relaxation of Stark in you know, like Back provisions and the FCC, as Amy showed you, broadband is uh, is truly a social determinant of health, and we have availed. We were successful in our proposal to the COVID-19 telehealth program, and we are delighted that the FCC approved the Connected Care pilot program, which has not yet been launched. The RFP is not out yet, but we intend to apply for that. That's a $100 million fund that provides broadband to the home of the patient uh, for low-income patients and veterans. And then another thing, licensure was um, was mitigated a bit, although in Virginia we still require license licensure to practice telemedicine in the Commonwealth, with the exception of um, 
maintaining continuity of care. If you have an established doctor-patient relationship with a provider in another state, you can continue to provide those services in Virginia now. And also we can, hospital systems and clinics can contract with um, non-Virginia licensed providers so long as we notify the Board of Medicine of those contracts and the states in which they're licensed. Next, please. So we had to have an all hands on deck approach to um, scaling our response to COVID-19, which included engagement of health IT, expansion of our enterprise, enterprise WebEx agreements and epic transformation. We created a, a MyChart enabled WebRTC platform uh, that's been a little challenging. We like most um, healthcare systems have, have no, noted that we have problems connecting to our patients. And some of it is because of those same social determinants of health, lack of broadband in the home setting. We've deployed more hardware and clinics to support video conferencing, facilitated bring your own device as necessary because of what the HIPAA enforcement relaxation. We've had to ex, uh, engage scheduling teams and billing and billing in compliance teams uh, to tr and to track changes in payment policies. All visits had to be integrated with an Epic templates as well. Next, please. We've also had to expand our telehealth team workforce and bring back some folks who've been in retirement to help us deploy to some of the community settings, such as long-term care or correctional facilities. We've had to communicate regularly with our providers. And I'm really thrilled, especially in this presentation, to share that we've created a fabulous um, data analytics process to track our progress. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to show you some images. Uh, that's a Tableau database. We've had to survey our providers to find out what's worked and what's not. We now have an RFI out for an enterprise-wide Epic integrated platform. And of course, we've had to engage with federal and state policy makers and all relevant stakeholders. Next, please. So this is a snapshot from our, um, our Tableau database, and we can we track a uh, number of virtual visits, total completed encounters, and actually in um, March it was around 3,000, in uh, April it was around 25,000. As we began to open up our clinics again uh, with appropriate uh, guidelines monitored by, you know, the, following the, the uh, guidance of the CDC, our numbers of telemedicine encounters, virtual visits have dropped, uh, but they, we still have set a goal of um, between 15 and 20% of all visits going forward will be virtual. And we also can use this Tableau database to track the types of encounters as well. Uh, so the various programs that we offer, you can see here represented. Next, please. The thing that I really love about the Tableau database is we've been able to track by zip code of our patients uh, where we've provided telemedicine services. So this is pre-COVID-19. Our traditional referral area is the western half of Virginia, and you can see uh, by zip code where we've provided telemedicine services to patients in the Commonwealth. That's uh, February. Next slide. March, you can see by zip code again, we expanded virtual visits. Uh, April, please. Next slide. May. Next, and we've pretty much covered the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. So data analytics is a critical element of what we do. Prescaney has uh, national surveys uh, and we have received 1900 responses. The responses of patients are incredibly favorable and at least 83% are willing to have future telemedicine visits after the COVID quarantine is over. And I will say once we uh, complete our RFI for an enterprise-wide solution, I hope it will be even more than that. Next, please. So where are we going from here? The genie's out of the bottle, and I don't think it's going back. I'm hoping that public policy changes will endure. Certainly the home is an eligible originating site, um, is, has been integrated into a number of bills that are uh, being introduced, and some other, um, some other uh, liberalizations of some of the Medicare policies, the commercial plan policies, and Medicaid programs. So with that, I'll conclude, and, make, and I know Amy and Ruben and all would be uh, very much willing to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, that was just incredible. Both of you, uh, Dr. Ruban, Karen, I've known you for a long time, was incredibly impressed 15 years ago. You have not slowed down. No. So, it takes a village, right? <laughs> the academical village, the University of Virginia village. We all do it together. And, and I'm sorry I didn't take the time to, to mention your accolades. Former president of ATA, so oh. provided leadership to the nation, always willing to share. Thank you for coming today. Amy, incredible story. And at the end, you tee up how telehealth truly is a key part of it. So your partnership is very, very impressive. We did have some very good questions, one of which was, 
how do we make sure that tech closes the gap as opposed to widening the gap in disparities as a as SDOH continues to be something that is important? If both of you could comment. Um, from my perspective, it's you know it's helping to advance broadband deployment uh, uh, across uh, the nation. And the FCC has been a wonderful partner to do that, but every chance we get to advocate for infrastructure improvements, that's important. Our state Medicaid program, as we've expanded Medicaid, we make availability to um, smartphones for many of our Medicaid beneficiaries. So I think that will help. But then of course we have the issues of the uninsured and uh, we need to work with community health center partners as well. Mm -hmm. And Amy, anything to add? Uh, I mean, I, I think I, I would say that one of the things is always making sure that if you as a health system or a health plan are investing in a technology, that you make sure that the technology company itself has thought about that So, um, and has that as the center and the focus of what it is that they're doing. So I, I think, I mean, I've seen these... Um, the platforms looking at uh, texting to get people to come to appointments and get people to follow guidelines and take their medication. And so making sure that that platform has considered race, ethnicity, language, and cultural experiences um, at the center and core of what they do, not as, an not as an afterthought. So thinking about smart investment where the companies you're investing in clearly have that as a central tenant of what they're doing um, is, is really key so that they are considering it. If you are considering partnering and, and working with technology, that you pick partners that align with that mission as well. So speaking of partners, one of the challenges historically for SDOH or telehealth is that the people who benefit aren't the ones that have the current uh, the dollars or the control. And you're talking about bringing people together and aligning their uh, objectives to be able to, to really deliver the benefit. Any ways that you see we might take collaboratives like Medicaid redesign collaboratives that are out there and, and in, enlighten people that it's not just their perspective that matters, but somehow get a benefit to uh, address everybody. I think collaboratives are very important and I entirely agree with your, your recommendation. But they're, they're hard to get people aligned, so we have to entice them somehow. Okay. Um, feel free to uh, submit questions. We have another one. Um, how do CBO referrals and the referral process impact the ability to address the uh, social determinants and speed of referrals? And then do we have any data about where we're not able to get those CBO referrals done, how that negatively impacts care? Like it's so important to get those done and addressed. Yeah. So I, I actually I'm going to let Reuben talk about this because I think he has a lot more data from uh, multiple healthcare systems rather than uh, I can talk about it locally. But I think Reuben, if you want to. Yeah, uh, it, it, I think it's it's very much of a community uh, 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 related concept because um, in the community there's going to be different levels of uh, community wide resources. We found that in rural areas um, there's you know, uh, certain types of CBOs that are maybe less present, and um, then it becomes a planning exercise with those uh, with those communities around how might we uh, incentivize or, or be able to create the kinds of nonprofit organizations that, that are needed. Um, and then I think um, I think this is why the the second part of the question, which is why this is so important to have the data, is because. Um, it's not enough to just uh, make a referral and send it out into the ether, so to speak. You need to know, did they go, uh, what's effective, what's working? And, and I think it's very helpful if you can create combined data sets of, uh, with appropriate consent, uh, combined data sets that involve the community data and uh, community referrals and the EMR data or HIE data all together so that you can really get a full portrait of how you're impacting specific patients and uh, conditions. 
So um, when that's possible, when that's achieved, then you can really have a sense of uh, where their improvements are needed, where um, you're really having success. So I think the data uh, from both sides, the health sector and the social sector, uh, is really important to, to address that question. Great. And uh, Karen, Dr. Ruban, do you anticipate introducing any new telehealth services or any new models to address social determinants that are inhibiting care? Like you mentioned the uh, mission, the homeless facility and getting those people online to avoid trips to the hospital and hopefully chronic care. Uh, do, you, and do you see that perhaps increasing and in any other new services uh, that you think you might be able to offer Amy and her community? Well, you know, I, I defer to Amy as well. I mean, we have a, a homeless clinic, clinic at the homeless shelter in Charlottesville. Anyone, anyone who asks for a telemedicine service, we provide it, whether it's, uh, and, and community is our goal. We started with an outreach program to begin with. That was the genesis of our uh, telemedicine program. So I would say, yes, if someone asks, we support it. And we've deployed technology that includes the remote examination tools, as well as, you know, HD video conferencing in those settings. So Amy, do you plan on uh, getting other sites uh, rolled out and, and, and cascading this, being a cheerleader? Um, I, I definitely do. And I think that there's also like benefit of expansion of what is provided in the telehealth consultation. And I know Karen and I have talked about this before and we've looked at doing this actually. Um, uh, Drew Harris, who's my husband and works really closely with Karen on other um, issues around FQHC support is, thinking about telesocial work and telelegal aid um, partnered with the health component to try to think about addressing social determinants in these FQHCs that are more rural and may not have access to those social services that are really critical for helping people. And so kind of how do you, similar to kind of a a medical legal partnership that's like physically present, how do you bring in social work into these small practices that can't um, afford to have a social worker on site? And how do you bring in a legal provider similarly to these other areas? So not just directly into the patient, maybe directly into the patient's home, but also at these smaller rural clinics um, that are serving these areas or homeless shelters or, or prisons and those sorts of things. So I think it's really critical um, and, and can be partnered then with a, a technology similar to pieces where the referral platform is there um, and integrates already with our EHR. Right. Um, so it really gives a close. Loop. The other right. piece is that, apropos that, that uh, Amy's comment, we are looking for a technology that will enable more than one individual to participate in the encounter from different locations at a time. So you can have teams that are meeting virtually with our patients as well. So we're almost out of time. Let's do one more question. Al, do you see on the chat the, the question from Carla? Uh, I've seen a lot. Let me see here. No, I'll, um, I'll just ask it. It says, do you see telemedicine incorporating the ability to address the patient's rights process for notification of HIE participation as well as HIPAA notices in the near future? I don't see why not. Uh, you know, uh, we get patient consent, so there's absolutely no reason we can't get as much as information from the patient as possible, and we just document it. Well, I, any, any last, last, um, you know, for the, for the panel of three, any last, um, you know, thoughts that you'd like to share with the work group participants, any suggestions or, you know, mar marching orders going forward? Collaboration, I think is great. So sharing of resources and collaborating is, um, is imperative and lessons, sharing lessons learned as well. Good, good thoughts. Amy? Um, not, I think always just trying to, to think about what your vision and goal is and who are the best um, people uh, to sit in the room and help make decisions with you um, uh, with equity kind of, I, I think equity is a really important central framework to kind of approach all of our work. And I know Karen um, and Ruben do as well. Thank you. And Ruben? Uh, no, I just, I, I really, I've really been excited by the national interest um, and recognition of social determinants as being a core equity and justice issue um, and uh, and now that we're now on the threshold of technologies and and processes uh, that can that can help 
work on those issues is, is really exciting. Thank you all for joining this call for that. I guess Ruben would like us to take it in pieces, um, but thank you <laughs> everyone very much. I am so humbled every time uh, UVA friends, Amy, I hope I can consider you a new one. Thank you very much. And, and uh, please everybody give us other ideas uh, to address this year is social determinants of health. We'll figure out what we'll do next year. We want ideas, topics, uh, we, and uh, best practices examples. Thank you so much to the panelists and, and Al, as always, you know, helping to, to moderate. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thanks all for, for participating in the meeting. And we will, we will catch up with you next month. Thanks again. Okay. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank Bye -bye. you all. Bye.